Hello, and welcome to another SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. The JWST's early release science program is making a variety of observations during the first five months of science operations that will allow scientists to quickly learn how to use the telescope's instruments and produce scientific results. As a part of this program, one team is making high contrast images of exoplanets and their systems using the near infrared camera or near cam and the mid infrared instrument or MIRI. The first direct images of Super Jupiter exoplanets HIP 65426b and VHS 1256b have been processed and submitted for publication. Joining me today is the program's co-PI, Andrew Skemmer, from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you, Andy, and welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, really quickly, I just want to say thank you to our audience for joining us. Uh, wherever you are joining us from, please let us know. Welcome to our viewers from around the world. And uh, thanks once again for coming and watching us today. So, Andy... What is this particular early science release program? What are its objectives? What is it looking to do? So our aim is to image planets around other stars, exoplanets. And what makes this difficult is that the stars are really bright and the planets are really faint. And so it's hard to see the planets in the glare of their host stars. Mm -hmm. So James Webb um, can has the ability to see these planets really, really close to their stars and it uses a special optic called a coronagraph to block out the light from the star. Imagine you're holding up your thumb and blocking out the light from the sun so that you can, you know, you're driving and you want to get the glare off of your windshield. It's the same idea. Um, and now you can see those faint plants around it. So our program has um, a technical objective of figuring out how to make all of that work. And of course, a scientific objective of getting to do this for the first time and, and getting some of our first looks at, at exoplanets with James Webb. So the results that have come out, there's two uh, papers in process and uh, they've been submitted. They're all written, ready to go. Um, what are these two discoveries that you guys are publishing already? So the first one um, tests out this coronagraph and we're observing this planet Hip, Hipparchos 65426b. So this was a planet that was discovered by a ground-based telescope, uh, the Very Large Telescope, which is uh, run by ESO in Europe. Um, and they have a special instrument that's good for imaging exoplanets. And it images planets in the near infrared, so usually around one micron wavelength. What James Webb can do is image it at longer wavelengths. And mm -hmm. so we took a variety of, of images covering the full wavelength range. Um, the longest of which was at 15.5 microns. And the previous record for the longest wavelength image of an exoplanet was at five microns. This is three times as far. Wow. So what that means is that we, when you can see the light of an exoplanet at all wavelengths, you're seeing different parts in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just the difference between what Jupiter looks like in the visible and the infrared. Maybe you have a, a slide you can show up for Let that. Let me get that for you. You know, planets just look very different at different wavelengths. And so um, here on the left is Jupiter in the visible, that's reflected sunlight. And in the in the right is the infrared, and that's where you're seeing thermal emission from deep inside the planet. So every time you can observe a planet at a different wavelength, you can learn something different and you can kind of collect all of the light that comes from the planet. So that's what we were able to do for the first time with these HIP 65426b images. And so, you have those images here. And so we're, this is this is a, the image that was released uh, via the ESA and NASA's blogs. And so this is showing us some of those images that you guys have collected of this particular exoplanet. So will you explain what we're looking at in this in this particular set of images? Yeah, so um, the the big overall image with all the stars in it, um, that's a, that's from the digitized sky survey, and it shows a large region of the sky, and it shows this one particularly bright star, and that's HIP 65426. When there's a planet around it, we put a little uh, lowercase letter. If it's, if it's an uppercase letter, it's a binary star. If it's a lowercase letter, it's a planet. Mm -hmm. So um, when you go to those bottom insets, that's showing the James Webb images. Uh, we have seven of these images. This is showing four of those. And uh, at the location of the star, we've drawn in a star in, in PowerPoint, but 
that's where the star actually is. And it was blocked out by that coronagraph. And next to it, um, a little bit to the lower left, in all four images, you can see this bright source. Um, that source has a funny shape, um, but it's actually a point source, um, meaning that we're not seeing any spatial structure on the exoplanet. We're not seeing like continents or oceans or things like that. All we can see is a single point of light at these different wavelengths. Um, but you can learn a lot by looking just at these single points of wavelengths. You can start to figure out um, what is, the, you know, what is the temperature of this object? What is the composition of this object? Uh, and that's the sort of things that we're doing with this data set. Okay, I want to talk to you some more about that, and we've already got some questions rolling in along the same lines. But first, let me welcome some viewers here. Um, we have people watching from Houston, Texas, the Philippines, Los Angeles, Norway, Denmark, Tennessee, Washington State, North Carolina, Brazil, here in San Jose, where I'm at, uh, England, Alaska. Wow, welcome. Um, let's see, uh, Gu Guadalupe, wow, New Jersey, Florida, some more from Norway, South Wales, the Azores, uh, New York State, Chile, Virginia, Toronto, Canada, Missouri, New Jersey, Germany, Northern Ireland, uh, Sacramento here in California, uh, Montana, Montreal, uh, some more people from Quebec, Ohio, uh, more from California, Chicago, quite a few from Chicago. Welcome, Chicago. You're all watching. Uh, Arizona and Philadelphia. Wow. Welcome, everybody. That is that is quite the uh, global and national audience. Thank you so much. Um, so we were you were starting to talk about how we can determine, I'm going to take the slide down for a second, um, how we can determine sort of some of the compositions of the planet. And um, some Jonathan Wolf on LinkedIn is asking, can partial atmosphere composition be inferred from the data? So is that the kind of thing that you're talking about here? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, these are this particular atmosphere and most of the things that James Webb is taking pictures of uh, for exoplanets. Um, these are gas giant planets. So they're a lot like Jupiter. They have the same composition, which means they're mostly hydrogen and helium. But then they have uh, some other molecules in them as well that really uh, dictate what the spectrum looks like. So um, the most dramatic of those is, is water vapor, H2O. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's um, carbon monoxide and methane. Those are some other big ones in this, in, in this particular one. Um, we have this particular object at seven wavelengths. The other paper has the object with a spectrum at thousands of wavelengths. And so we have a really good composition on that one. That's the, um, there's a slide on that, which is uh, a spectrum. Uh, let's see this one here. Yeah, so this is the second object we looked at. And this is a full spectrum of a planetary mass companion. Um, this one was not taken behind a coronagraph. It was sort of a very, very wide separation object uh, that's not caught in the glare of its, of its host star. And this was a second goal of our science program. So the first goal was to figure out how to do coronography and make sure that we could see planets that were caught in the glare of their host star. Mm -hmm. And then we said, well, we also want to know what these things really look like. Like, let's take the best spectrum we possibly can of a planetary mass companion. So that's what this is. This is the best spectrum ever of a planetary mass companion. And so this is uh, real James Webb data. It spans all the way from one to almost 20 microns. And then I have a zoom in on an inset for just one small little feature. Um, and this is, oops. And this is the. Uh, this one? No, 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 on the same side. Oh, oh OK, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you look at this bottom panel, this inset here, you can just see the enormous amount of features that we see here. Each one of these lines where it's wobbling back and forth, those are all from carbon monoxide. So that's the, that's the every single one of those is, is real. This is not noise. That's all carbon monoxide absorption features wow. uh, that we're seeing at you know, four to five microns. And every spot in this spectrum um, is similar quality. So we're seeing all of these different molecules um, in this particular spectrum. And yeah, I mean, it's it's really clear. Um, there's there's no ambiguity what this molecule is. This looks like if I went into a lab and heated up a bunch of carbon monoxide and took a spectrum of it, that's what it would look like. That's, that's amazing. So this is sort of kind of, I, I, sort of to me, the, the, 
the grail of what we wanted from JWST and to see these this these results you know within a few months is amazing so what else what else are we working on here what else are we seeing in some of these images so um if you know i think what we're learning is about um how complex and dynamic these worlds are so mm -hmm. we've gone from being able to see single points of light and we're, we're doing that with james webb to be able to see single points of light at many different wavelengths and even in a couple of these uh, cases with, with the easier plans to see, we can get spectra at, at tons of wavelengths individually. So these are worlds that, you know, we can start to see them changing their, their variables. So just like on that slide where I showed what Jupiter looks like, how it's got all those patchy clouds on it, we see the same thing on these planets. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one with the spectrum is actually quite variable. So as it rotates around, you see it get brighter and fainter. Um, imagine you're looking at Jupiter when the great red spot comes into your field of view in the infrared, the planet gets a little bit brighter. And when it rotates out of your field of view, it gets a little bit fainter because we can't take for these exoplanets, they just look like point sources. We can't see the great red spot, but we can infer it by how variable mm -hmm. it is. So we're seeing that we're, we're seeing evidence of clouds on these exoplanets. Um, in one of them and maybe both of them, we see absorption from silicates. So that's like sand particles that are condensing in the atmosphere of the planet. Um, mm -hmm. You see that at, at about 10 microns. So that's really new, right? We've never been able to image planets at 10 microns before. And the wavelength where you can see these silicate features is at 10 microns. And so now we're able to see, hey, the thing that's causing that variability that's making it patchy is this you know, solid state stuff that's condensing in clouds in the atmospheres. So that's sort of, I mean, as I said, audience questions are already rolling in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and take some of these because they're kind of relevant to what you're talking about. So Tyler Walker on LinkedIn is asking what features most excite you in these findings? And that sounds like possibly one of them. So are there any others beyond the silicate, the discovery of silicates in here that you're finding exciting in these results? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we did, we published these papers really fast, which means we got this spectrum and then, you know, there's there are all these different lines and we're panicking about hey can we identify all of these and so the ones that we've identified so far are some of the easier ones that we expected i think it's possible that there's more that that is in this data that we haven't found yet um an obscure line that doesn't quite fit uh where we didn't expect it and we're going to be working on staring at the spectrum and and putting out more publications to try to figure that out in in the data that we have right now i would say i was most excited to see the silicate feature um, and the, the CO feature, which I showed you, I think is the most photogenic feature. Um, all those bands that look, you know, exactly like a comb, um, with, with such regularity. Um, there are other features in there. We think we might see CO2 in this one, but we're not sure. Um, we see some features like sodium and potassium that we expected. There's a lot of water vapor, which we expected. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, mostly we're just blown away by the quality of the data and trying to figure out what to do next. Wow. Um, OK, I'm going to give a few more shout outs. We've got people watching. It looks like from I've just got a few more uh, from New Zealand and North Carolina. OK. Wow. OK. It's been an amazing audience here. All right. Um, let's see. This is oh, here's another really good question. We're going to go with this one. Manav on YouTube is asking, how long does the telescope take to do these measurements? Yeah, so um, our program, it observed different targets. The spectrum was pretty fast. It was about four hours. Um, the images were a little bit longer. I think those were about 12 hours. And the reason why is because in order to, you know, remove that glare of the starlight, you have to point James Webb at the science target, and then you have to move the telescope and observe a star that doesn't have a planet. And that helps you subtract, subtract out the starlight. Um, James Webb is very, very sensitive. Um, so it, it, it collects a lot of photons. It collects a lot of information very quickly. It's not necessarily the most efficient telescope. So it takes a long time. If you want to change targets with James Webb, you know, it can take an hour to change targets. Um, which is a lot, you know, if, if, if for the amateur astronomers in the audience, of course, you can slew your telescope in. In under a minute, you know, James Webb is the size of a tennis court, um, so it takes a little bit longer. Um, 
So overall, our program took about 60 hours. We're observing a couple things that haven't been published yet. Um, and we're trying to do a really careful job with it. So um, NASA was, was insistent that, you know, any data that we're getting um, is high quality so that, you know, the first data really show what we want them to show. They were very conservative about the time allocation, making sure to make, give us plenty so that we would have the results that we want to do. We might start taking more shortcuts now that we know uh, where we can. So since one of the objectives was basically to, to get scientists to learn how to use the instrumentation, how do you feel that that process has been for you and your team? Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, we tried to prepare for this. We, you know, wrote our original proposal to do this five years ago. Uh, and then there were some delays and took a while just to get a, Just a months. few delays, yeah. Yeah, so during that, you know, we used that time as best as we could. We, um, we, we would simulate data. Uh, we would practice reducing that data. We would have different people try to reduce other people's data. So we've had a lot of practice. Um, when the data finally came down, I think that was useful. It, it didn't work right out of the box, uh, some of our some of our code, but we took a few days and got it to work. Um, we're a very large team. There are over 100 people on our team working on this data. Some people are working more on the theoretical models. Some people are working more on the data. Um, but we were trying to do this very quickly. Um, all of this data is public, by the way. You can go to NASA's website. Um, the, the, the website where I download this stuff is called MAST. Um, and you can all the data you can download and you can work on reducing it yourself. Um, that's not always true for telescopes. Usually James Webb gives you, a, if, if I apply for time on the telescope and get it, they give me a year to reduce the data so that I can be really careful. Um, but since this was the first data, they wanted as many people to get their hands on it as possible. And so there was no proprietary period. Anybody can download it as soon as it comes down. And that was to motivate us to work very quickly, which we did. All right. Um, let's see. We've got some people watching from Belgium. Welcome. And Turkey. Welcome from Turkey. And some more in California. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And some another person from the Philippines. So, again, this wonderful global audience. Um, what has been your role? Because um, you said there's hundreds of people working on this this particular data set. What has been, as a co-PI, what do you do? What is your role in the project? Yeah, so uh, there's a leadership group of us, which is three of us, um, a PI and two co-PIs. And, um, you know, when you have a hundred astronomers who are all very excited to get their hands on the data, of course, you want to make, make sure that everybody um, is getting to do the part they want to do and that people are communicating with each other. Um, so we did something a little unusual, which is that um, UC Santa Cruz invited everybody to come and visit. Not all 100 people came, but about 40 people came. And so I hosted this big workshop that was going on while the data was coming down. Um, and that really helped keep us organized because we could all sit in a room together or sit outside of picnic benches to be COVID safe. Um, and that allowed us to, to work together on this. Um, my other, it, my other specific role is that um, uh, the authors of those first two papers are both in my group at UC Santa Cruz. So um, the person who wrote the paper about the images of exoplanets, that's Aaron Carter, who's a postdoc in my group. And the person who wrote the paper about the spectrum is Brittany Miles, who's a recent PhD student from my group. Um, and so we've, the three of us have been working together for for years now, um, preparing for this data and, you know, knowing exactly what we wanted to do when the data came, came down. And then it's a matter of executing our plan as best as we can, understanding that there's going to be some unexpected things along the way. It's it's very exciting and I'm, I'm really enjoying these early results. You know, I, I think it's always fun when Hubble came out of sort of like, look, amazing images and this really cool. And then science kind of takes a little while. So it's really nice to see that they did it sort of differently with JWST, which after <clears throat> decades of anticipation, um, thank goodness. <laughs> um, let's see, we've got a few more questions. I want to kind of, uh, okay, let's see. Um, 
This is an interesting one. Adam Watson asks, are we able to LIDAR or demonstrate a solidified mass under the under the gas of these hot, these giant Jupiters? Yeah, so um, in this case, the planets are, are Jupiters. Um, and so they're gas giant planets, kind of like the gas giant in our solar system, Jupiter. Now, um, these planets are very far away, hundreds of light years. So if we were to try like a LIDAR on them, you'd, you'd send it out and you wouldn't get the signal back for hundreds of years. Right. Um, but on the other hand, you could, I mean, you could ask the related question, if these things kind of look like Jupiter, could you do that on Jupiter? And, and the answer is no, Jupiter is, is opaque. So basically if you, if you shine a visible light in, it is gas all the way down, at least until that light gets absorbed. Um, if there's something solid further inside Jupiter, there are other ways of detecting it, but you're not gonna be able to detect it by bouncing light off of it because the light will get absorbed. And is, is there any other way that we could sort of figure out the la layers of composition of these gas giants? In Jupiter's case, we send missions there. That helps. So we can, um, um, there's our mission uh, Juno, which has been orbiting Jupiter, and it tries to measure, um, you know, the, the, the different, so the gravity field of Jupiter, which can give you some information about this. That's one way of doing it. Um, in the case of these exoplanets, uh, what we're relying on is theoretical models. So, mm -hmm. um we know something about the equation of state of things at high temperatures and high pressure, the people who can do that in a lab on Earth and, and people who do theoretical calculations about that. And basically, those models and data predict that gas giant planets are all about the same size. They're all about the size of Jupiter, even if they, they're much more massive. So HIP 65426b, you know, from our, from our imaging data, we think that this is about seven times the mass of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. But it's the same diameter as Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, and so these equations of state predict that all these things are the same size. Um, how do you measure the size of a planet? There's another technique that people use called the transiting technique, which is another thing that James Webb is doing a lot of. And in the transiting technique, you see a planet pass in front of the star and block out a little bit of the light. Mm -hmm. And when it does that, you can say, okay, I've blocked out 1% of the light. Therefore, my planet's disk is 1% of the area of the star. And people can use that to measure the radii or the diameters of planets. And so our models seem to be per working pretty well. So are we going to be able to see, like, will the images get better if we have more time on the telescope? Or is there sort of a maximum exposure time where it kind of, that's it, that's all you're going to get and anything more just becomes noise? Um, for the, for the particular object that we looked at, um, I don't know if those are as perfect as they're ever going to get, but those are pretty good. Um, good enough to do the science with, which is what the real goal is. Um, they're pretty high signal noise, most of them. Now, I think where the stretch goal is for James Webb is to be able to see lower mass planets. Mm -hmm. Right now we're imaging, um, things that look like Jupiter. Uh, James Webb is capable of imaging things that are more like the ice giants, like, like Neptune and Uranus. And there are some projects going on right now um, to, to look for those plants. We've never seen them before, which means James Webb has to go and look at stars and hope that there's something there, which is harder than, in this case, we knew there was something there. So James Webb's gonna do that and we may see some, uh, we, we may in very deep integrations be able to see new types of plants. Yeah, that actually uh, tracks along with a, a question that Fabio uh, asked over on LinkedIn was, how close are we to finding and seeing another Earth with James Webb? James Webb cannot see another Earth. Um, so when you're doing imaging, you know, we can do the gas giants and uh, it's got this, it's got the sensitivity to see um, things like Uranus and Neptune, but it hasn't done it yet. I think it will. Um, but it, it's not enough to see an Earth-like planet. So... Um, you know, NASA is always planning ahead. And so uh, there was recently um, a big panel that met that tried to decide what are the priorities for NASA going forward. And the top priority is to um, build a, teles a space telescope that would be able to image a rocky planet like Earth, an Earth-like planet. And um, that mission doesn't have a name yet. Sometimes people call it LUVEX or LUVOIR. 
Um, but it, it'll get named something different. And the the uh, goal would be to launch that in 2045. So um, right now we're imaging, you know, the gas giants, the Neptunes and Uranus-like planets. Um, they're super interesting. We're learning a lot about them. And we're learning a lot about how to image exoplanets. Um, I look at that image of Jupiter and I say, this is, this is a super interesting planet. I'd like to see that sort of stuff in other solar systems. But, but there is a long-term goal of being able to image rocky plants and Earth-like plants as well. And that, that's going to have to be the next space mission. Now, um, James Webb can detect Earth-sized planets um, with the transiting method. Um, but it's a little harder to study their atmospheres with the transiting method. And of course, you can't really see them. And those plants might not be Earth-like. They might be orbiting lower mass stars. Um, many of them are going to be tidally locked, which means there's a hot side and a dark side that always mm -hmm. face in the same direction. So nothing that's quite like an, a bona fide Earth-like planet yet. <sighs> always the goal that that Earth 2.2 is still still that goal and 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 still not getting there. <sighs> Someday. Um, it's it's some huge strides though when it comes to JWST. I've I've also seen some some releases where they found carbon dioxide in atmospheres from from these uh, spectrum. So I'm, I'm I'm excited. And as you said, you guys still have a lot of analysis left to do, just on that one spectrum alone. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, well, I think we've we've about reached the end of our hour. So Andy, thank you or half hour. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I am really excited. What my, my last question for you is, what is next for you on this project? So um, in the next year, we, we've got some data on a disk, which is going to be really exciting. So this is like Saturn's rings, but around a star. And, and maybe these rings have a planet in them. We don't know yet. Um, we have some of that data and we're expecting to get the rest in the new year. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. So we're going to get to have you and maybe some more of your team members back next year to talk about some new results. Very good. All right. Fantastic. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today and for watching. As a reminder, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research and education institute. Um, this is part of our mission to share all of these wonderful science stories with the world. And if you're interested in supporting our work, especially for these SETI Lives, for our SETI Talks events, you can follow us on social media. You can sign up for our e-newsletter or you can make a donation either here or using Facebook stars, using YouTube Super Chats or you can just go to the link on your screen, which is seti.org slash give now. And you can also, while you're on our website, sign up for that newsletter, sign up for the newsletter. You get all of our, our, our planetary pictures of the day come to you um, once a week. You get our news stories, our links to all of these SETI lives and invitations to events, a lot of which are virtual and you can come enjoy. So once again, thank you for joining us. Andy, thank you so much for being here. Good luck with all this research. And I cannot wait to read more of what comes out from your group. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.